But you can see that we have a diverse representation here, Baptist, e free, and Presbyterian. And I just, I asked this question, I'm probably about the same age as these guys, but I'm going to defer to their uh, wisdom and expertise. So start with uh, Rick. Rick, do you think that it's a particularly difficult day, given all the recent developments in the blurring of denominational identities, the uh, shuffling, if you will, even within denominations, and all the issues that are um, on the table today, do you think it's a particularly difficult time for pastoral transitions, or has it always been this tough? Probably the uh, difficulty right now is the economy more than some of these other things. Uh, right now, we're finding in our nearly 200 churches, we used to have a 10% vacancy rate in a pulpit. Now it's more like 5%. So there are fewer openings. And um, I, re I met recently with a search committee of a church of 500. And when I found out they were going to do a broad search on every possible internet site, I predicted that they'd receive 200 resumes, which they did, some from foreign countries, some from people that didn't even speak English. So it's really very competitive out there that way and difficult. There's so much inundation to search committees that are not narrowly focused in their denomination that that does make it, I think, more difficult. And then changing location in this economy is much more difficult. So yeah, those, it is a tough transitional time right now. Mark, I could frame it just a little bit differently for you. It seems to me right now as though I could tell more about where someone is coming from theologically by asking what blogs they read than by knowing where they've been ordained. Do you think that's the case? And if so, what are the implications then for churches looking for pastors? Yeah, uh, I agree with you on the blogs. And to follow up on the second question you asked, I think if a church is looking for a pastor, rather than trying to figure out everything imaginable themselves, as it were, I would say go to another church that you like, whose ministry is what they would like. You know, you're on the pulpit search committee. Mm -hmm. You would like your ministry, your church, to be like that guy's over there. Go talk to him and ask him for a suggestion. Like, what are your thoughts about pastoral transitions. Within the Presbyterian Church, uh, do you find these same kinds of things at work now? Yes, <clears throat> the same sorts of issues are at play within Presbyterian denominations. I'm in a conservative evangelical Presbyterian denomination, uh, but the same factors are at play. I will say that one of, the, one of the issues that you face in pastoral transition is when you have a pulpit committee that is serving the congregation in bringing a recommendation to them. One of the, one of the difficulties that you can face is if that pulpit committee is not representative of the leadership that the pastor is actually going to have to work with in an ongoing way, there can be a significant tension. The pulpit committee can be thrilled about the person. The congregation always, to a certain extent, has to trust who the pulpit committee is bringing to them. But then the pulpit committee goes away and you may have a body of, in our case, elders and deacons who may not be so thrilled about the individual. And so it's very important, I think, both for the church that is looking and for the candidate that is considering the congregation to recognize what is the settled body of leadership in that congregation that I'm gonna to have to work with over time. Even if that body is not voting on you it itself, it's the congregation that's calling you, um, you're still going to have to work with that church leadership. And it's very important that you understand where they are, what they're expecting. Sometimes pulpit committees have worked helpfully, subversively. In other words, you might have leadership that's not as solid, and you've got a really solid pulpit committee. Subversive? That, yeah. make, that makes pastors <laughs> nervous, that word. But, I mean, in, in, you can have a situation where you have a, a church that has been, that has been theologically ambivalent, 
and you can have an excellent pulpit committee that wants to see the church be more doctrinally defined and more biblically uh, oriented in its practice and its message, and they can bring in someone that, that pulls the church in that sort of direction. But the, even that can set off tension if you have settled leadership that hasn't bought into that. So I would just say that's one factor you need to, to reckon with. What's, what's, the, what's the pulpit committee's relationship to whatever the settled leadership is going to be in that congregation? After the pulpit nominating committee makes a recommendation, does that go to the session? No. The, um, the congregation calls a minister in the Presbyterian Church in America, and the elders don't have a vote on that. The pulpit nominating committee makes a recommendation directly to the congregation. And that's why I, I say in our setting, you can have a pulpit committee that's really excited about an individual, and you really don't have a gauge as to whether the elders or the deacons are excited about that individual. And it's really important that, that you be aware of that reality when you're accepting a pastoral call or whether you're approaching someone. What does, say, a Southern Baptist church do if their pastor leaves and their current constitution says that the church elects a pastoral search committee. I mean, do you try and change that midstream and transition, or do you work with what you have? If there's tension in the congregation, then no. You let this one go with the pulpit search committee, but you try to help instill and build a mindset of if there's any time a congregation does not need to make sure you hear from the Jones family and somebody who's 22 and all that kind of stuff, but you get the most spiritually discerning men in the congregation who know the word if you ever need their wisdom and leadership. I don't know why the Presbyterians don't elder up at this point, brother. What's going on there? <laughs> they, we, we, we used to. Um, in fact, I think, I think was, I'm was correct. Was it a reaction against liberalism and liberals being in control? I, I have no idea what brought about the change, but I think the change happened in the late 1960s. Typically, it would have been a subset of the elders That's of the congregation that would have served the yeah. congregation as their effective pulpit committee. Yeah. And then it changed in the 1960s. Doctor, either Dr. Don Patterson, who was my predecessor once removed, or Jim Baird were the first people in the 12 ministers of First Presbyterian Church Jackson over 175 years. They were the first ministers called by a, a pulpit or recommended by a pulpit committee to the congregation and not by the elders. Yeah. Well, I bet what had happened, you had godly laymen. So the congregation asserted it's Jesus given rights in Matthew 18 implied over the session and decided that they would not put up with any silliness and in God's providence that helped to get him you as a pastor. 